Hi there again, good to see you in the virtual environment. This is Unit 4 where we're going to talk um, animal nutrition, and this will be a three-part mini-lecture series um, breaking down the content in this section. So let's hit it. So when we talk nutrients, there's six big ones that we're going to talk about. These are the basic classes of nutrients. They are water, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals, and vitamins. Uh, one that's not a nutrient that we will talk about towards the end of this mini lecture is non-nutritive additives and some of the things that they will bring to the table in your animal diets. I've added a couple images here to the screen just to remind you uh, what concentrates and uh, roughages might look like. Let's break down each one of these uh, more specifically. And the first one, of course, is water. This uh, clearly is the most important of the six nutrients. And without adequate water, everything else does not work appropriately. There's a difference between water and moisture. Of course, water is that drinkable uh, fluid portion that animals would consume. And then moisture is present in the foodstuffs that they do eat. Uh, for example, corn silage is oftentimes going to be about 68% water and only about 32 percent actual dry feed uh, so that can be somewhat calibrated into the ration but more or less all feeds except for mineral and vitamins is going to contain at least a little bit of moisture and so sometimes we can account for that in the diet like i alluded to there's a difference between uh, water and then dry matter and, and water is sometimes a problem in the diet because we have it, it's so variable at time and space upon what the animals are consuming so sometimes we want to just simply talk about the dry matter component of the diet and basically that's how all rations are formulated in the first place uh, there's a list of functions of water here at the bottom of the slide and but suffice it to say is basically nothing happens uh, positively in the in the body without adequate water supply. It basically is the conveyance for all functions of the body in some form or fashion. Next, next let's hit on carbohydrates. And I've got a few images here of, of what might represent some examples of carbohydrates, corn in the upper left-hand circle, oats in the middle circle on the right, and then wheat in the bottom circle. And there's a number of different other ones. You'll find that we'll subcategorize a lot of different feedstuffs in these nutrients, and carbohydrates is the first example where we will break them down into simple carbohydrates. And for example, like starch is a very simple carbohydrate. It's really easy to digest. It's super dense and high in energy and is the main constituent in most rations. Uh, has to have a lot of easily digestible starch content. And corn would be a prime example of that. Then, of course, we have complex carbohydrates, and basically the difference is, is how easily can, can it be digested. And so semi, uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin are here, whereas the grain component, the, that starchy material inside the corn kernel is starch, the uh, cellulose and hemicellulose, the complex carbohydrates, are found within the cell wall. So like the leaf structure is going to, be, is going to also contain uh, energy fractions of carbohydrates, but it takes a lot longer to digest it. It's a little harder to get to. Uh, the stalk fract and the stalk has, of course, also some cell wall, uh, lots of cell wall in it, which is also even harder to digest. So, but both of those carbohydrate fractions are important in animal feeding. Next, let's briefly talk about fats. You may hear them referred to as oils or lipids. Uh, and it's really important to understand the role of fats is to help bridge the gap sometimes in energy feeding. Oftentimes we run out of room in the diet before we can, uh, by just feeding carbohydrates, before we actually meet their full energy need. Fats are 2.25 times more energy dense and so therefore can, uh, can help fill that void, so to speak, whenever we can't get enough energy in the diet. There's a number of different things that fats do besides just bring energy. They're also precursors to hormones like prostaglandin. Proteins are next, and they get a lot of the fanfare with regard to feeding rations. And that is primarily because uh, they, they contribute the most cost to your diet. And again, we're going to subcategorize these things. Uh, they are, there are simple proteins, which are just simple, short, little uh, protein chains like an egg protein. Uh, with few amino acids, very weak peptide bonds that are very easily digestible and taken up into the body. And then there are, of course, complex proteins that may be a protein attached to something else like a glucose molecule or a lipid molecule. 
proteins are calculated. Uh, we measure the amount of nitrogen, and then we multiply that times a factor of 6.25 in order to calculate the amount of protein in a feedstuff. So it's not a, protein itself is not an actually measured component. Of course, proteins are composed, uh, like we mentioned, of amino acids. And essential amino acids must be supplied in the diet because the animal can't synthesize or make them themselves. And so there'll be a list of essential amino acids here in a subsequent slide. Most of those non-essentials the body can actually make uh, in some form or fashion once it is properly um, fed. So here's that list of essential versus non-essential amino acids. And um, as we get on to further uh, discussions on nutrition and then even into animal nutrition class for those of you who take it next semester, is we'll subdivide some of these essential amino acids into first limiting, second limiting, and so forth in terms of importance. Minerals come next in our discussion, and we will again subdivide these into macro or micro minerals. Now, please don't uh, confuse this. Both of them are highly, highly important. You absolutely need both of them in your diet to be successful for your animal to uh, be able to produce as, at its optimum level of performance. The macro minerals are just required in much larger amounts than the micro minerals. And it's important that we understand that properly balanced mineral feeding is the right approach. Uh, feeding too much is oftentimes not only just expensive, but you can have some minerals that actually antagonize or block the uptake of other ones. So it's really critical to keep those things in mind. You certainly don't want to be deficient or, or not feed them appropriately, but feeding too much can also be problematic. Here's that list of micro and macro minerals, and again, I'll let you uh, pause the uh, pause the video or download these in the notes in order to uh, make sure that you understand each of them. Vitamins, again, ex exceptionally crucial. Even though we may feed only a little bit of, of, a, of a vitamin, it takes just a little bit to do the right thing in the body. And again, we're going to subdivide these into fat-soluble and water-soluble. The importance of those is what substance do they need needs to be present for them to be absorbed. So vitamins A, D, E, and K, those fat solubles, there needs to be some amount of vegetable or animal fat in the body, uh, in the digestive tract, in order for the small intestine be able to be able to pull up or, or absorb any one of those vitamins. Likewise, when we talk about your water solubles, like your B12 or B-complex vitamins or niacin, or riboflavin, uh, those all need water in the gut in order for the small intestine to be able to absorb those appropriately. Um, so that's uh, really critical that we make sure and understand these things. Ruminants have the unique capability of actually making some of these vitamins in the water soluble category, uh, which is really important and helpful in, in animal feeding. I mentioned that we would get to some non-nutritive things. Of course, you can add a lot of different stuff to your diet for various reasons. Uh, for example, we might add antibiotics uh, to a uh, growing piglet ration or to help them fight off some respiratory disease that, that may be threatening them. We may add dewormer uh, to your horse diet in order to uh, help them uh, kick any potential um, parasites that they've picked up out on pasture. So there's a number of different things. Uh, at the bottom of the slide here, it talks about VFD requirements. Those are veterinary feeding directives. And in many cases now, you have to have a prescription from your veterinarian in order to add these to your ration. So make sure that you're not only working in concert with your nutritionist, but also if you need these things, you're working in concert with your veterinarian in order to write these prescriptions for appropriate feeding levels for the appropriate reason. Kind of as we get to wrapping up this section here, I want to talk briefly about feed analysis. It's super important to understand what is in your feed, that we test it appropriately. You need to know the levels of protein, the levels of mineral, the levels of carbohydrate that are in your feeds in order to know how much of that feed to feed. And it lists here a few things that, it's, that will be tested whenever you send a sample into your laboratory. Uh, here's just kind of a crosswalk or a ladder structure of all the different things, components that will be in approximate feed analysis. I'll let you study this one on your own. But there, the, the feed analysis is not only going to determine dry matter and moisture content, it can also predict digestibility, which is exceedingly important in being efficient in today's animal feeding systems. It can give you a real critical breakdown, for example, of energy feeding uh, and do that evaluation for you and 
really predict at what points in the digestive tract uh, certain energy components will be taken up and what may impede them from being taken up effectively. Again, it'll measure a number of different other things uh, as we talk about these energy components, but those are all reported oftentimes in caloric density, just the same as your, your and my uh, feed or food breakdowns. Here's a flow chart of energy uh, usage by the animal. So at the top of the chart, of course, we have feed intake. At the bottom of the chart, we have energy that is committed to either maintaining the body or some kind of production capacity. And then things that require energy that is kind of a tax, so to speak, like it costs your body energy in order to get rid of fecal material or urine uh, or dissipate heat. Uh, so we have to account for those things because those are losses of energy that can no, can't, cannot um, be contributed or attributed to maintenance or production. So I'm going to pause there. We're going to take a break. Um, that's going to wrap up mini lecture one. So make sure that you've taken really good notes. Uh, you've written down, written down some questions that you'll share with me uh, in the muddiest points and, and in class discussion. And I will look forward to chatting with you further about how we go about successfully feeding animals. Have a good day.